Welcome to day five of my 14 day SAT prep series. In today's video, what we're gonna do is wrap up SAT practice test 10's math with calculator section and then wrap up the writing section for SAT practice test 10. So what this means is that as I go through these problems for the SAT math section, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you my insights, my tips, my tricks, and my advice for the math with calculator section as well as the math section as a whole. So hopefully that'll help you get a better understanding what to look for on the SAT math section. And then when we start with the SAT writing section, once again, as I go through those problems and those questions, I'm gonna be looking to give you my insights, advice, tips, tricks, and strategies for the SAT writing section to hopefully help you improve your score. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with question 21 from SAT practice test 10. All right, so we have an equation 0.1x plus 0.2y equals 0.18x plus y. We're told Clayton's going to mix x milliliters of a 10% mass solution of saline with y milliliters of a 20% by mass saline solution in order to create an 18% by mass saline solution. <clears throat> The equation above represents the situation. If Clayton uses 100 milliliters of the 20% by mass saline solution, how many milliliters of the 10% by mass saline solution must he use? Okay, well, we know that we have 100 milliliters of this 20%. So that means that Y then will be 100. So what we can do is we can go ahead and put in 100 for Y, and then we just solve for X because we need to know how many milliliters of that 10% by mass saline solution, which is what X is representing. So we just got to solve for X. We have 0.1 X then plus 0.2 Y. We know that Y is 100 milliliters. We can just put 100 in for Y. So we put 100 in for Y. We know that that's going to be set equal to 0.18 times X, which we know when we distribute this 0.18 to X, we'll have 0.18 X. And then plus 0.18 times Y. We know that Y is 100. So we take 100, multiply it by 0.18, and that's going to give us plus 18. So we'll put plus 18. Now at this point, we also have the 0.2 times 100. We know that that's going to give us 20. So we can go ahead and subtract that 18 from each side, right? Subtract this 18 from each side. 20 minus 18, that's going to leave us with 2. Next thing that I've got, and I'll erase that so it doesn't look like it's over 2. We know 20 minus 18 will leave us with 2. Thus, we'll have 2 equals this minus 0.1x because we have to get rid of it. Put all of our x's on one side. Minus 0.1x. So 0.18x minus 0.1x. That is going to leave us with a 0.08x. So now we have 0.08x equals 2. So 2 equals 0.08x. At this point, we divide each side by 0.08. Divide each side by 0.08 to solve for x. We see that that will cancel over there. And we'll be left with x equals 2 over 0.8, which we can plug in our calculator. Since this is the math with calculator section. And when we do that, we're going to get an answer of 25. So our correct answer for 21 then will be answer choice B. So a couple of big things to understand here. One advice and tip that I have for when you're dealing with questions on the SAT math section is try to keep X positive if you can. So you saw that I subtracted um, this is 0.1X from each side from this is 0.18X. That way I kept my X positive so I don't have to worry about forgetting a negative. I also, you saw that I tried to keep my integers positive by doing this 20 minus this 18 equals 2. So always try to keep... Um, your your x variable positive if you can or that coefficient in front of your x variable positive that way you don't have to worry about messing with negatives so that's just one uh, minor tip that i have for you for that question all right question 22 the first year eleanor organized a fundraising event she invited 30 people for each of the next five years she invited double the number of people she had invited the previous year if f of n is the number of people invited to the fundraiser n years after eleanor began organizing the event which of the following statements best describes the function f okay this function is going to look something like this, right? It's going to grow increasingly uh, large as, all right, right here we're going to have uh, invites, right? We know that our number of invites is going to get uh, much, much higher over time. And why is that? Well, it's doubling every single year, okay? So if we think about it, we go from 2 to 4, then we go from 4 to 8, and then we'd go from 8 to 16, 16 to 32, and we see that it just gets exponentially larger. So the function f then is an increasing exponential function since we are doubling every single year. We're not decreasing, so we can get rid of that. Also, once again, an a, not decreasing. We are increasing, but not linearly, so b is wrong as well there. So that one right there, not too bad, not too difficult, just understanding the different types of growth functions. All right, question 23. We have some values of x and their corresponding values of y are shown in the table above, where a is a constant. I'll go ahead and erase some of this so we can see it better. We have if there is a linear relationship between x and y, which of the following equations represents the relationship? All right, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a look at my rise over run. I see when I go from 0 to negative a, that's a rise of negative a. Now, what's my run? Well, I see that I run that same period 
from a to 3a. So that's positive 2a. We increase by 2a in our x variable. So I see my a's are going to cancel, right? My a's cancel there, and I'm left with negative 1 half as my slope. So now I've got to find an answer choice that has negative 1 half as my slope. First thing that jumps out to me immediately is that in options a and b, I see I have a 2y and then an x. Now, what that tells me is that I got to subtract x from each side. When I do that, I'll have 2y equals negative x uh, plus a in the first one. And I'm just going to use this as an example. We divide each side by 2 then, and we see that we do indeed have negative x over 2 as our slope. So options a and b, they have the correct slope. I look at options c and d, I see that they don't. Because if I add y to each side, right, if I add y to each side, then I see I have y equals 2x, right? y plus 7a equals 2x. Either way, not the correct slope in either of those. So I can go ahead and get rid of those two because they don't have the right slope. Next thing I look at is the difference between a and b, and I see that that is this term right here. So I see that if I find my intercept of my uh, table up here in 23, I do that by finding when x equals 0. So i got to move half of a normal jump. I see I've been jumping by 2a, or negative 2a as I go from to the left, right? As I go to the left, I go down by 2a. I need to only go down by 1a then. Okay, so I'm only going down by 1a, so I have a zero here. We'll make another box there with that zero. Now, normally when I go over to the left by 2a, I go up by a. But if I'm only going over to the left by one, I must only go up by half of a. So therefore, I must have a over two. We see that we have a over two in option uh, of answer choice a, right? As I pointed out when I drew up this equation here, right? We have negative x plus a all over two. That over two also applies to that plus a. It could be rewritten like this, negative x over two plus a over two, right? So now at this point, what we can go ahead and do is we go ahead and know that a is our correct answer there. We can move on. A couple of just things to note uh, for this one, always make sure that if you have a table like this, I'm going to erase it so you can see better, a table like this with your x and y variables, or it could also be arranged in a column, right? If you have columns like this with x here and y here, just make sure that you're marking it up, making sure you get to the correct slope. So never be afraid to mark up tables and graphs. I always think that it's very helpful and prevents you from making simple mistakes. All right, question 24. Okay, so I've got a graph. Uh, I see I'm asked which of the following could be the equation of the line of best fit. Okay, this one's pretty easy. Now, you'll notice that I kind of jumped to the end there of this question without reading much of uh, what was contained right here. Sometimes you can do that if you recognize the question type. In this case, since I just got to solve uh, for the line of best fit, which I kind of could figure out since I just saw all my answer choices had a y equals, I just kind of jumped to the end, see if I could figure it out without listening to any of this, and I see that I can. Now, one thing you do want to watch out for is just what your variables are named. In this case, we know that the number of registered voters is x, and we know that the number of people who voted in the last election is y. So if we take a look at our graph then, we've got a number of people who voted. We know that, that said it was equal to y, so we're all good there. So now we just solve for our slope and solve for our problem. So we see that we go up from 60 to 30, or from 60 to 90, so that's an increase of 30, because 90 minus 60 is 30. And we see we go over um, 180 minus 120, which is 60. So our rise of 30 over our run is 60 over 30, which is one half. Thus, my slope then must be answer choice B or my equation must be in stress B because that's the only one that has Y equals 0.5X. All right, so that one right there, not too difficult. Big thing that I recommend is marking up your graphs, right? You see how I did my rise and my run there. Always mark up your graphs when you can because it's going to help make sure that you don't make a simple mistake. All right, the system of equations above is graphed in the XY plane. What is the X coordinate of the intersection of the point XY in the system? All right, so this big thing here, I talked about this in a tip video that I included a couple of days ago in this course. Um, I talk about canceling out variables. So the f big thing that I immediately recognize when I look at this question is I see I have to solve for x, okay, and I see that I have minus 1 half y and plus 1 half y. I know if I multiply this bottom equation by 3 and then I add the top equation to the bottom equation, that's going to cancel my y and I'll be able to solve for my x. So that's what I'm going to do here, right? I apply this 3 to this 1.6x, I apply it to the 0.5y, and I have to apply it to that negative 1.3. Now, when I do that, I have 3 times positive 0.5y plus negative 1.5y, and I know that that is going to give me 0y. Okay, so I have no y term at that point. So now I can just worry about my x's. So I have 2.4x, and then I have plus 3 times 1.6x. So 3 times 1.6x is going to give me 4.8x, 4.8x, and now I just add 2.4x, and I know that's going to give me 7.2x. 
So now I have 7.2x is equal to 0 0.3 plus negative 1.3 times 3. Negative 1.3 times 3 is going to give me negative 3.9. I add 0 0.3 to it. That's going to give me negative 3.6. So I have negative 3.6 is equal to 7.2x. So I'll write that a little bit bigger so you can see it. Okay, at that point, obviously we just want to solve for x. We're going to divide each side by 7.2 divide each side by 7.2, and we see we have x equals negative 3.6 over 7.2, which we know will equal negative 1 half. So our answer there will be A for number 25. So that one right there, big thing, and the big tip involved in this one is knowing that you should add and subtract. Whenever you see you have, whenever you, see you have a stacked equation set, so I'll erase this so you can see it, anytime that I see a stacked equation set, which looks like this, I'm always going to look to add or subtract something to cancel out a variable and get to my answer. Or in some cases, and I think we had this on one of the problems we did in the last couple of days, we were able to add in order to get, um, I think it was 5x plus 5y down here, and we were asked for the value of 5x plus 5y, and by adding, we were able to get it set equal to, I think it was 2,500, and we found our answer that way. So anytime you see stacked equations, look to add or subtract to get to your answer somehow. All right, question 26. Keith modeled the growth over several hundred years of a tree population by estimating the number of the tree's pollen grains per square centimeter that were deposited each year within layers of a lake sediment. He estimated that there were 310 pollen grains per square centimeter the first year the grains were deposited, with a 1% annual increase in the number of grains per square centimeter thereafter. Which of the following functions models P of T, the number of pollen grains per square centimeter, T years after the first years the grain, was, grain were deposited? All right, so the first thing that I'm looking at is my initial value is going to be 310. I see all my answer choices have that. Next thing I'm looking at, I know C is going to be wrong because I know that I am increasing every year by 1%, and that has a decrease. Next thing I look at, I know that B is going to be wrong because B has 1.01 times T in its um, exponent. We know that since we're increasing by 1% each year, the correct way to write that would be with that 1.01 being multiplied by that 310, but that 1.01 being raised to that T power. Okay, so our answer there is going to be answer choice D. This one right here, we talked about this on day one with our SAT math formulas and growth rates and growth formulas. We know B is incorrect because this 1.01 is not uh, as an exponent, but it is actually written like this, as it is in D. Option A, once again, option A is going to be wrong as well because it's just having 310 to the power of T, not including that 1% growth rate. So that one is wrong as well. All right, next thing that we're going to look at, obviously, question 26 was just dealing with making sure that you understand how to write um, growth formulas. So now we can go ahead and take a look at question 27. All right, question 27. So we've got, based on the equation above, what is the value of 3x minus 2? First thing that immediately jumps out to me is I see I have 9x minus 6. I know that one third of 9x minus 6 is going to be 3x minus 2. So I don't know if I included this in a tip video or not for this series, but one tip that I do have for the SAT math section is always be looking for ratios at all times. Anytime you can identify a ratio between two different numbers, it's going to help you find your right answer. It's generally written as a ratio for a reason because it's going to help you get to that answer faster. And the SAT understands since it's timed, anytime that they put a ratio, they can help you help yourself to get to that right answer faster. So they do include ratios often. Being able to recognize those ratios is crucial to scoring highly on the SAT math section because it is indeed timed. All right, so first thing I'm looking at, like I said, I've got to get this 9x minus 6 and I got to get rid of, uh, I got to solve for 3x minus 2. So like I said, I know that one third of 9x minus 6 is 3x minus 2. So what I'm looking to do immediately is subtract this two thirds from each side, right? So I want to subtract this two thirds and this 9x minus 6 from each side. So that's going to cancel it here, right? Now this is gone, but now we got to subtract that two thirds, two thirds, 9x minus 6 from this side. Now, what are we left with then? Well, we have one times 9x minus 6 minus two thirds of it. Thus, we are going to be left with one third 9x minus 6, which we know when we distribute this 1 third to 9x, that's going to give us 3x. And when we distribute 1 third to negative 6, that's going to give us negative 2, thus leaving us with 3x minus 2. Now, what is that going to equal? Well, it's going to equal this negative 4. So we know our answer then is going to be A. So in this case, did we have to solve for x? Absolutely not. Okay, so just going through and blindly solving for variables isn't always going to help you. Okay, oftentimes you're just going to be doing more work than is needed. So Pay attention to what you're asked to answer with. If you went and solved for x here, you're being dumb, okay? You're just not doing things efficiently. You want to understand what you're asked to answer your question with. Always pay attention to what you're asked at the end of your question on the SAT math section. That's the value of 3x minus 2. Solve for 3x minus 2. Don't go and solve for x because you're not getting any points for that. So answer there is going to be A. All right, question 28. 
we've got which of the, we've got the function f is defined above, k is a positive integer, which of the following could represent the graph of y equals f of x in the xy plane? First thing that jumps out to me immediately is I know my graph has to open up because I have x times x giving me x squared as my largest um, exponent with x as its base. I see that my graph has to open up, thus a is wrong, and thus b is wrong as well. Okay, so right off the bat, I eliminated two very quickly. That's always a good thing. Next thing I look at, I see I have a difference in my roots for c and d. That's how I'm going to know which one is correct between those two. I see I have x plus 3, which I know if I set that equal to 0, I'm going to end up with x equals negative 3. Thus, I need to have a um, x-intercept at negative 3. I see I don't have that in c. I see I do have that in d. Thus, d is my correct answer. So big things with these graphs. You always want to pay attention if it's something like a parabola to wh whether it opens up or opens down. If it had been negative x squared, then it would have opened it down, but it wasn't. It was x squared, thus we knew it had to open up, thus we got rid of a and b right away. So anytime you can get rid of wrong answer choices on any section of the SAT, do it as quickly as possible. If you know an answer choice is wrong, go ahead and mark it as wrong so you don't have to deal with it anymore. That's crucial to scoring high on the SAT, and that's something I highly recommend. All right, moving on, we've got number 29. We've got the formula above can be used to represent the height, h, and inches of an adult male based on length, l, and inches of his femur. What is the meaning of 1.88 in this context? Well, we know that if our femur grows by one inch, our height will increase by 1.88 inches, or at least the estimate will. So let's find an answer choice that says that. We have the approximate femur length in inches for a man with a height of 32.01 inches. That is incorrect. The approximate increase in a man's femur height length in inches for each increase of 32 inches in height. Nope, the approximate increase in a man's femur length in inches for each one inch increase in height. Okay, C is a reverse relationship. You got to watch out for this on the SAT math section. You really got to watch out for this pretty much everywhere on the SAT. Um, most commonly, you want to watch out for the reverse relationship on the SAT reading section, particularly with science passages. Also, the SAT math section as shown here. In this case, it's saying the, act, the approximate increase in a man's femur length for each one inch increase in his height, but that's not what 1.88 is. What 1.88 is, is it's the approximate increase in a man's height, not his femur length. Okay, it's the approximate increase in his height in inches for each one inch increase in his femur length. So D is the correct answer for that question. Okay, so you got to watch out for that on the SAT. Watch out for reverse relationships. They can trip you up. Okay, we have in quadrilateral A, B, C, D. We've got A, D is parallel to B, C. Um, next thing we see is that we have C, D is equal to one half of A, B. Okay, so we've got C, D. We know that's one half A, B. What is that also telling me? Well, that's also telling me that from B to here is also one half A, B. Okay, so I'm asked for the angle, the measure of angle B. Once again, always paying attention to what I'm asked to answer with. Okay, measure of angle B, that's going to be all the way from there to there. I know I have a 90 degree angle right there. So I've got 90 degrees plus what this blue angle is, right? I'll put this in blue. We got to solve for that in order to get that measure of angle B. So if I take a look at my triangle, I know that this is going to be a 60, 30, 90 triangle. So where's my 90? My 90 is right here. Where's my 60 and where's my 30? Well, I know that my 30 is going to be right here and my 60 is going to be right here. And how do I know that? Well, I know that I have AB right here. And I know I have half AB right here. I'll box it up so you can see it. So in that case, I have a 60, 30, 90 triangle. Now, if you don't have this triangle memorized, I talked about it. Um, I believe I talked about it in my SAT formulas video. If I didn't, I'm going to talk about it right here real quick. So a 60, 30, 90 triangle. Let's go ahead and just draw it up real quick. So what it's going to be is you're going to have um, a value, we'll call it 2x right here. And then you're going to have, we'll go with 30 degrees right here and 60 degrees right here. Okay, on your 30 degree side, you're going to have x, and on your 60 degree side, you're going to have x times the cubed root of 3. Now, what you need to know here is that you see that across from your 30 degree angle, you have angle x, or I'm sorry, you have side length x, and your hypotenuse is going to be two times whatever that side length is. Okay, so thus, since we have hypotenuse a, b, our side across from our 30 degree angle has to be half of a, b. Thus, we know our 60 degree angle, since all the sides in a right triangle add to 180, must be 60. So thus, our answer must be 150, since 150 is equal to the 60 plus our 90 there. All right, so hopefully that tip right there is helpful. Um, if you didn't have this in your notes already, go ahead and put it there. Now, one thing I can also quick cover um, is going to be your 45-45 triangle. Okay, I believe I might have already covered this, but I'm not totally sure, so I'm just going to put it in right here. So you've got two 45 degrees in your triangle. Let's go ahead and say that we've got um, an x here and an x here. Then your uh, your hypotenuse then is going to be x times the square root of 2. Okay, So that right there, hopefully that is helpful. And with that, let's go ahead and move on 
uh, to our next problems. So now we are on the free response section. So for the free response section, you don't have the multiple choice answers that you can just get rid of. You're going to actually have to solve through for things. So we have Limey has $8 to spend on apples and oranges. We know that apples cost 65 cents each and oranges cost 75 cents each. There's no tax on his purchase and she buys five apples. What's the maximum number of whole oranges she can buy? Okay, well, we know that she's got $8. So she's got $8 and we know that she has she's buying 65 cent apples and she's buying five of them. Okay. Now keep in mind that her eight that her eight dollars has to be greater than or equal to how much money she's spending. So then we have to add in that 0.75 times however many oranges she gets. So we'll just write times oranges. Okay, we got to solve for the most oranges that she can buy. So we're going to plug in our calculator. Um, we'll go 0 0.65 times five. When we do that, we get 3.25. So 3.25. Now we subtract that 3.25 from each side. Subtracting 3.25 from each side. Subtract 3.25. Now we're going to do 8.8 .8 minus 3.25 in our calculator. Then we're going to divide it by 0 0.75 to solve for our number of oranges. So we'll go ahead and do 8 minus 3.25. That's going to give us 4.75. And now we got to divide that by 0 0.75 to get our number of oranges. So you can plug that in your calculator as I'm doing right now. And you're going to end up with 6 and 1 third. Here's the problem though. You can't have 1 third of an orange. So the most that she can buy then is going to be 6. So that one right there, pretty simple. The things that could trip you up is if you didn't realize that it said maximum number of whole oranges. Okay, you got to pay attention to that. You can't have a fraction of an orange. So always pay attention to if you have to round. Okay, rounding on the free response section is important. Understand when you have to round and when you don't. Okay, next thing we got, question 32. I'm told A is 34. I'm asked for the value of B plus C. Once again, pay attention to what you're asked to answer with. In this case, it's B plus C. I know that my total of all my angles within a triangle are going to equal 180. So if I take 180 and I subtract that 34 degrees, I'm going to have what B plus C must equal. And I know 180 minus 34 degrees, when I plug it in my calculator, or you could do it mental math, either way, uh, you're going to get 146 as your answer. So 146 will be your answer for that one. All right, moving on. We've got question 33. So we've got the mean of five numbers. And I'll go down and I'll erase my, my oranges math over here so we can see this problem better. Okay, so we're told if the mean of the five numbers is 1600, so we know 1600 is the mean of five numbers. So we know that we had to divide by five to get our mean. What is the value of x? Well, that's going to be our sum. So we got to take our 700, we got to add 1200. We know that that's going to give us 1900. And then we got to take that, we got to add 2000 and 1600 to that. That's going to give us 3600. So we'll add that. We know that that is going to end up giving us, let me do this quick in my head. It's going to give us 2000 plus 35. Which will give us 5,500 up top. Now keep in mind we also have to add x to that. So we're going to have 5,500 plus x over 5. So now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply each side by 5. So we can start isolating x. We got 5 times 1,600. We can plug that in our calculator if we want to right now. We'll go ahead and do that. 5 times 1,600 we know is going to give us 8,000. We have 8,000 then equals 5,500 plus x. We minus 5,500 from each side to isolate x. We know that 8,000 minus 5,500 is going to leave us with 2,500 equals X. Okay, so our answer there is going to be 2,500. All right, so that one right there, not too difficult. Key things there is understanding that you're dividing by 5 and also remembering you have to add that value of X. If you remember that, then that problem becomes fairly simple. All right, 34, we have a relationship between X and Y. It can be written as Y equals MX, where M is a constant. If Y is 17, when X equals A, what's the value of Y when X equals 2A? Key part here, it's a linear function. This is what's going to allow us to use this trick here. If we know Y is 17, when X equals A, and we know it's a linear function, um, then what we can do, since we know that there's no intercept as well, is we can just double this 17, since we are doubling what X equals. So if we double what X equals in this case, since it is linear um, with no intercept, we just double our value of y that we had here. So thus we do 17 times 2, giving us our answer 34. So that one right there, not too bad at all. Fairly simple, fairly quick. All right, 35. In the equation above, a and b are constants. If the equation has infinitely many solutions for x, that's a key, key part here, we're asked for the value of b. So once again, not solving for x necessarily here, but we've got to solve for b. 
So if it's going to have infinitely many solutions, that means it's got to have the same slope and the same intercept. So if I've got a slope of 4x, I know that a is going to have to be 4 because that's going to give me 4 times x, which will give me 4x as my slope. Next thing I see, I've got plus 10. So I also need this b times 4 to equal 10. So thus I would have 4b equals 10. I solve for b by doing a division of each side by 4. So I have b equals 10 over 4. So 10 over 4 is going to equal b. Right, we, got, we could also rewrite that as 5 over 2. We could also rewrite that as 2 and a half. Okay, in this case, we'll put 5 over 2. All right, next one, we got 36. Key parts for 35, really just understanding if you have infinitely many solutions, that means you got the same equation. Okay, so same formula, same equation. All right, next up, we've got in the xy plane, a line that has the equation y equals c for some constant c intersects a parabola at exactly one point. If the parabola has the equation y equals negative x squared plus 5x, what is the value of c? Well, in this case, I'm going to substitute in this y equals c. So I got c now equals negative x squared, negative x squared plus 5x. Now, key part here that I see is that it intersects the parabola at exactly one point. Thus, since in, in day one we talked about this, if it intersects at exactly one point, then there is exactly one zero or it intersects at exactly one point, I got b squared minus 4ac equals zero then, since it intersects at only one point. Thus, what I can do here is I can take this c, I've got to set this equation equal to zero, so that way I can use this b squared minus 4ac rule to solve for what c is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add x squared to each side, so I can keep that positive. Okay, so I'll add x squared to each side, subtract 5x from each side, obviously that's going to cancel. What I'm going to be left with then is I'm going to have x squared minus 5x, and then plus c equal to zero. Now, b squared, what's my b value? b value is going to be negative five. Negative five squared, we know is the same as five squared, is going to be 25. Next thing I've got is minus four times ac. What is a? a is one, since we have a one in front of this x squared. And then we have c, okay, so times c. Thus, we can go ahead and set that equal to zero. We go ahead and add this four c in order to isolate our c on the one side of our equation. And thus, we're going to add four c to the other side. We're going to have 25 equals four c, we're going to divide each side by 4 to solve for c, and we're going to have 25 over 4 as our answer. So, key things to understand here. Since we intersected at only one point, we could use the equation b squared minus 4ac to solve very quickly. Uh, that's really the key part there. And then understanding we have to set this right here equal to 0. Thus, we added that x squared and subtracted that 5x. The reason I did that instead of subtracting that c is because by doing this, what it's going to help me do is it's going to help me to keep this x squared positive, right? And I like dealing with those positive exponents more than those negative ones, just because it makes things simpler most of the time. All right, next next question we got is 37, so we only got two more here. So obviously this is going to be one that contains a little bit of information prior, which most of 37 and 38, in my opinion, that as far as I've noticed on the practice test, usually those are linked questions together. So just something I've noticed. All right, the Peregrine Falcon can reach speeds of up to 200 miles per hour while diving to catch prey, making it the fastest animal on the planet when it is in a dive. We have, what is a Peregrine Falcon's maximum speed while diving to catch prey in feet per second? Keep in mind that the answer is not 200. Why is it not 200? Because that was 200 miles per hour, and now I'm asked for feet per second. Round your answer to the nearest whole number, and I'm given that one mile equals 5280 feet. So I've got 200 miles per hour. I've got to convert this to feet per second. So I've got miles per hour. So what do I want to do here? Well, I want to cancel my miles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by the fact that I have one mile per every 5280 feet. Okay. Or hang on, I'm sorry. It should be multiply by 5280 feet, 5280 feet per mile. Okay. 5280 feet per mile. Okay. That way our miles cancel. Okay. We see this mile will cancel with that mile. Okay. I'm sorry. I initially wrote that one wrong, but obviously I quickly catch my mistake. Now, why did I catch my mistake? Well, because I'm canceling units, right? We talked about this in a trick. I do believe a couple days ago, if we did not, we're going to talk about it right here. Okay. We know that when we cancel units, it helps to check our work and make sure we're doing things correctly, especially in ratios problems like this, where we have one mile equals 5280 feet or anytime you have one, something equals another. Okay. Canceling units can help make sure that you have it set up correctly. So in this case, now what we're left with is feet per hour. Okay, so we have feet per hour. Now, how are we going to cancel out this hour? Well, how we're going to cancel out this hour is going to be the fact that we know that there are 60 minutes in an hour. So 60 minutes in an hour, and there are 60 seconds in a minute. Thus, 60 times 60 is going to give us 36 uh, zero, zero seconds per hour. Okay, so what we're going to have to do here then is since we have feet per hour, we have to multiply then by hour up top, okay, so we have one hour up top over 3,600 seconds, 
Okay, so now let's go ahead and do that in our calculator. So we're just going to do all of this at once in our calculator. So we see what this boils down to is that we're going to cancel this H, because keep in mind this H is on that bottom denominator, and now it's up here. Our H is going to cancel, and we're going to have feet right here per second right here. Okay, so that's how we know we're going to get to our correct answer. So let's go ahead and put it in our calculator, see what we get, and then put it in our bubble sheet. Obviously, we're not going to because we don't have a bubble sheet out right now, but we would if we were taking the SAT. So 200 times 5280, then what we're going to do is we're going to divide it by 3600, and we're going to get 293.33. Now, if you answered 293.33 or 0.3, you're going to get it wrong because you're asked to answer to the nearest whole number, which is just going to be 293. So 293 will be your answer. Once again, always pay attention on the SAT math section to what you're supposed to answer with. All right, 38, if Peregrine Falcon dove at its maximum speed for half a mile, okay, to catch prey, how many seconds would the dive take? All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use that value that I just got for uh, for my feet per second, and I'm going to use it to solve this question. Okay, so I've got 293. Now, keep in mind, I do want to keep that one-third that I got in my calculator uh, just to make this one more accurate. So I know that it, it has two, a speed of 293 and one-third feet per second, and I know that this is going to be uh, maintained for half of a mile. Okay, so how many seconds is this dive going to take? Well... We want to know our answer in seconds. So what we're going to do then is we're going to take our feet that we have to travel, which is going to be half a mile. So we take this 5280 feet and divide it by two to get half a mile. So 5280 feet over two, that's going to give us half a mile. So what we're going to do is we're going to do distance equals velocity times time. Okay. So this is an equation you should also know if you don't have it in your notes, you should put it in your notes. So the distance we have to travel is 5280 over two feet. We know our velocity is equal to 293 and one-third feet per second. We have to solve for the amount of time it's going to take. Thus, what we're going to do is we're going to take our 5280 over 2, and we have to divide that by this 293 and one-third feet per second. 293 and one-third feet per second. We see that our feet are going to cancel. Okay, So that's, once again, checking our answer or checking our work by canceling out our units. Feet are going to cancel. We're going to be left with our answer in seconds. So let's put that in our calculator and see what we get. So we have 5280 over 2. Next thing we're going to do after that is divide by that 293 and 1 third. When we do that, we're going to get 9 as our answer. So 9 will be our answer there. So canceling units, obviously, very, very useful in checking your work and making sure you're getting to your correct answer, especially when dealing with ratios of distances and ratios of times and ratios of units. So hopefully this was helpful for the math section. At this point, we're going to go ahead and switch over to the SAT writing section. I'll be giving you my insights, tips, tricks, and advice as I go through two passages from SAT Practice 10 there. So let's get started with that. For today's SAT writing practice, I'll be going through the last two passages of the SAT writing section of SAT Practice Test 10. As I go through, I'll be giving you my tips, tricks, advice, and strategies for the SAT writing section. And with that, let's go ahead and get started with this first passage that I'll be doing today. So we have marsupials lend a hand to science. Marsupials, mammals that carry their young in a, in a porch or in a pouch are a curiosity among biologists because they lack a corpus callosum, the collection of nerve fibers connecting the two hemispheres of the brain. In most other mammals, the left hemisphere of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right hemisphere controls the left, and the corpus callosum allows communication between the hemispheres. Scientists have long believed is what that should say, and that's a strategy that I use that I'm going to explain right now. Okay, it should say have long believed because it has to indicate that they believed in the past and still do believe that this structure enables complex complex tasks by sequestering skilled movement to a single hemisphere without sacrificing coordination between both sides of the body. All right, so how did I immediately know what the correct answer was going to be? And the correct answer here is going to be uh, have long believed, if that's an answer choice, which it has to be because it's the correct answer. Okay, how did I know that immediately had to be the right answer? Well, this is a strategy and tip that I recommend for the SAT writing section. If as you're reading through, you read through and you get to something in the middle of a sentence like this, if you have words in the middle of a sentence, which in this case are underlined, uh, such as are long believing, and it's the middle of a sentence, okay, in the middle of the sentence, anytime you have words underlined in the middle of the sentence, what I recommend doing is try to come up with your own answer choice as to what the correct answer should be. Because oftentimes you've read enough that you have enough context behind what's going on in the passage and in the sentence to understand what tense the verbs are. Uh, what number your subjects are and what number your verb should be. So you're able to pretty much answer it right away without even looking at your answer choices. At least some people are. Now, if you're not, what you should understand here is that you can use tense, right, to understand what this has to be as your answer, okay? Because scientists believed it in the past and are still believing it in the present time, it should say have long believed. So that's how we know that's our correct answer. Now, 
Hopefully that makes sense to you as to why if you have words underlined middle of the sentence, it's usually useful to try to come up with your own answer first. Um, but that's one strategy that I do recommend using. Now question 24, let's keep reading on. So we have this question would explain handedness, <clears throat> the tendency to consistently prefer, prefer one hand over the other. All right, so this one right here, I can pretty much already tell this is gonna be a redundancy question. And if I look at my answer choices, that's even more obvious. If we look at question 24, let's just run through why options B through D are all redundant. Okay, option A is not, so we're actually gonna pick A, no change is not redundant. But if you look at all the other ch answer choices, they are, and I wanna show you why they are. So why is option A not redundant? Well, we have a tendency to consistently prefer one hand over the other. Nothing is repeated in that. That doesn't need to be repeated, right? There's really no repetition. Nothing is redundant. Now let's show why D, C, and B are all redundant. We have option B, and favor the use of one hand over the other. Well, we already say favor the use of, right? How do we say favor the use of? Well, let's go down and I'll show you. We see the word prefer, which means favor the use of. So that would be repetitive and redundant. Thus, B would be wrong. Big thing with the SAT writing section, avoid repet repetition and redundancy. If you avoid repetition and redundancy on the SAT writing section, it's going to help you out so, 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 so much. That's a huge thing that I'm going to stress in this 14 days. Option C, one hand over the other that could be chosen. Saying that could be chosen, right? We already said the word prefer here, which is in indicating a choice, thus C is repetitive and redundant. We want to get rid of it. D, we have one hand on a regular basis. Part that's redundant here is on a regular basis. We say consistently, right? I'll go ahead and highlight that in the passage so you see where I'm talking about it. We say consistently right there. So if we say it on a regular basis, we are repeating that, repetitive and redundant, thus incorrect. All right, number 25. However, a recent finding of handedness in marsupials suggests that a trait other than the presence of a corpus callosum, K, Key thing here, you saw that I just read through. Why did I just read through? Because there's nothing wrong with it, okay? This one right here is just making sure that you understand that you shouldn't just place punctuation in random spots in a sentence, okay? Correct answer for 25 is gonna be A, no change. Why? Because there's no need for any punctuation there, right? That's why I just kept reading. There's no need for it. We have a recent finding of a handedness in marsupials suggests that a trait other than the presence of a corpus callosum, there's absolutely nothing there that would indicate that we would need punctuation, okay? Nothing with grammar. Um, nothing with sentence structure. We need absolutely no punctuation there. Okay, so that one right there, just testing that you're not throwing punctuation in random spots. All right, so we've got other than the presence of a corpus callosum. Now, right here we have an idiom question. Now, what is an idiom question? Right, you may be thinking, oh man, another grammar thing that's going to be really complex. Well, an idiom question, literally, pretty much all that it means is it's just what sounds right. Right, what sounds right in the English language? What would we naturally say if we were, um, if we had English as our first language, what comes naturally, especially try to think um, how people in America speak English, right? So if you're from like the UK or Britain and you're watching this, just understand with these idiom questions, just try to say it like um, someone who's in America would just naturally say it. So in this case, would we ever say links as? We would never say links as because it's not idiomatic. We would never say correlates from because it's not idiomatic. We would never say links on because also it is not idiomatic. So correct answer there, B correlates with that is idiomatic. Just think, correlates with, right? We would naturally say that. We would not say links as, links on, correlates from. So idiom question is what 26 is. You can usually recognize them because they're going to have words like, uh, I'll go ahead and show you real quick. They're going to have words like with, from, on, and as at the end. They're going to have things like prepositions as that last word. So that's how you can identify idiom questions. All right. Next thing we got is 27. Researchers at St. Petersburg University and University of Tasmania observed marsupials walking on either two legs, bipeds, or four quadrupeds and performing tasks such as bringing to their mouths. The scientists employed a mean handedness index. Okay, I've got a semicolon there, which means I have to have an independent clause after it. So which choice is accurately reflecting the information in the graph? Well, let's take a quick look at the graphs. So we know what we need to indicate. We see we have a mean handedness index. We see we have all uh, left forelimb preference, which is indicated by a positive mean handedness index. We see that they're also all between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. So that's my main thing there. Nothing down here in this right forelimb preference and nothing negative. Okay. We see that we also have four groups of uh, animals right there as well. And they are all uh, bipedalers. All right, so we've got which choice accurately reflects information in the graph. Let's go ahead and take a run through. We have option A, negative scores indicate a left forelimb preference. No, we know that positive scores do. A is wrong. B, scores of zero or less indicate a left forelimb preference. Once again, that is incorrect. We saw negative answers indicated a right forelimb preference. Option C, positive scores indicate a lack of forelimb preference. Also incorrect. And then option D, positive scores indicate a left forelimb preference and negative scores indicate a right forelimb preference. That is the only one that is accurate according to the graph. Thus, 27, the correct answer is going to be D. 
So key thing there, if you're asked for which choice is accurately reflecting information in the graph, you better look at the graph. If you don't look at the graph, you're going to get it wrong. So you need to look at the graph. Key things to do when you're looking at a graph on the SAT writing section. You want to look at the title. You want to look at the axes. Okay, in this case, axis on the y-axis, mean handedness index. Okay, next thing, x-axis. We have bipedal marsupials. We got four different groups. Other things, just pretty much you want to annotate, annotate the graph. Annotating the graph is going to help you understand it. So read the title. You're going to want to read your axes. You want to read um, labels, everything like that. So that's what you want to do when you're dealing with graphs. Now we can go and move on to question 28. We have well eating the eastern gray kangaroo, red necked wallaby, red kangaroo, and brush tailed bitong. Okay, this is a list of four. We know that when we're dealing with lists, we want a comma prior to our last term, and we want the word and after that comma. Thus, A is going to be incorrect because we do have to make a change. C, we have a random semicolon in there. We don't want to have that. Uh, option D, we have a random M dash in there. We don't want to have that. Correct answer there is B. Okay, anytime you've got a list of three items like this or three or more items, what it's going to be is it's going to be your item one. Uh, so we'll just call it subject one, comma, subject two, comma, and then and subject three. Okay, and that's the same for any lists that are longer than three as well. All right, so that one right there, pretty simple. Now we got question 29. So we have all bipedal marsupials preferred using their left forelimb as revealed by, and now we're probably asked for which choice is reflecting data accurately in the graph, and we are. Okay, as reflected by what? What is indicating that they're preferring to use their left forelimb? Well, that's going to be their positive mean handedness index values, but it's not index values that are less than 2. Okay, so we can get rid of A. We know that's got to be between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, so we get rid of A. They're not greater than 0 0.6. B is wrong. Option C will be correct. They're between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, okay, and they're not values of 0, so D is wrong as well. Okay, key thing there, once again, look at how annotating that graph helped us know our answers really quickly. All right, the results suggest handedness among these animals. Okay, 30, which choice provides the best transition from our previous paragraph? Okay, in these cases where we have to transition from a previous paragraph to a new paragraph, what we need to do is we need to skip reading this at first. We're not even going to read what that says at first. We need to read what this paragraph is going to be about because if we're going to transition from a previous paragraph to a new paragraph, we got to know what our new paragraph is going to be about to make the best transition. So, new paragraph, let's read a little bit. Quadrupial marsupials in the study did not show a strong preference for the use of one forelimb. Okay, that's a key part of information. For instance, gray short-tailed opossums and sugar gliders were assigned mean handedness values very close to zero. They used their right and left four limbs nearly equally. In effect, the study provided no evidence of handedness among quadruple, quadru, quadrupedal marsupials. All right, so what is this? Having four feet, does that transition from our previous paragraph to our new paragraph? Absolutely not. Why does it not transition? Well, in that previous paragraph, we were talking about bipedalers' handedness. Option B, like most other mammals, once again, not providing a transition from our previous paragraph. Option C, in contrast to their bipedal counterparts, yes, right? We talked in that previous paragraph about the bipedal counterparts who do have handedness. Now we're talking about quadrupedals not having handedness. So what are we doing? We're linking that previous paragraph to this new paragraph. That's perfect. Option D, while using their forelimbs for eating, also incorrect because it's not linking that previous paragraph to the new paragraph. So whenever you're making a transition between paragraphs, you better link your old paragraph your old paragraph's ideas to your new paragraph's ideas somehow. That's how you're going to make your best transition. So pay att close attention to that. Okay, so you've got to pick the choice that is going to provide a good transition. So you've got to connect those two paragraphs somehow. In this case, best way to do that's answer C. All right, next up we see we have which choice presents a main claim of the passage. Okay, so a couple ways you can approach this one here. In this case, since this question is towards the end of the passage, we see that it's in our final paragraph. You could probably answer this without reading on a little bit. However, I want to provide a word of caution. If you see which choice provides or presents a main claim of the passage in this question is the first, the second, the third, or the fourth question, or a question that's really early on in the passage, you're probably going to want to read on because you might not know the main claim initially right off the bat in the introduction. So that's just a word of warning. I would just put a red flag by it, not because this question itself is difficult on this practice test, but just because you want to understand if you've got to find a main claim and state the main claim of the passage and that question was earlier on in the, in the question set or in the passage, you're going to want to read on a little bit to get more context and be certain of that main claim. So in this case, since it's at the end of the passage, we can probably just go ahead and answer it. Let's just go ahead and see if we can. We probably can. So we have kangaroos, though, still do not exhibit handedness to the extent humans do. That's not our main claim. Option B for the marsupials in the study, then, handedness seems to be associated with bipedalism. Yes. Okay, we talked about how uh, the bipedals, such as, uh, I can't exactly remember which animals it was. I think it was kangaroos. Um, but we talked about how they were 
uh, they were they did have handed handedness, whereas the quadrupedals who have or walk on four limbs did not. Okay, so that was the main claim here. Option C: There are many things scientists don't understand about the marsupial brain. Uh, no, we're we want to focus on that handedness with bipedalism. Option D: Additional studies on the phenomenon will need to be performed with other animals. We never say that, so that one's just incorrect. That one that one's a really bad answer choice. Okay, you should not be picking D. Option, uh, let's go ahead and read on and get to 32. As the researchers noted, the quadrupeds typically live in trees and employ all four limbs in climbing. The bipeds, on the other hand, are far less arboreal, leaving their four limbs relatively free for the tasks in which, okay, this right here is an idiom question. As There's also a few things I'm going to point out as well that can get you to the correct answer here. Now, once again, notice how as I read, I found my correct answer without even looking at my answer choices. I just said what naturally I would say in a sentence, right? So anytime you have one word underlined middle of the sentence, that's a strategy you should be using. Okay, so answer there is going to be B. Let's just go ahead and cover why the other ones are wrong. We wouldn't say tasks in whom because tasks aren't a person, thus that's wrong. Same thing with whose, once again, tasks aren't a person. As far as what, we wouldn't say in what handedness, okay, because in this case the tasks are plural. Since tasks are plural, we would say in which, right? We would say the tasks in which. All right, now we can go ahead and move on to 33. We have why the majority of marsupials study preferred their left four limbs while the majority of humans prefer their right remains a mystery. However, and now I'm probably going to ask, uh, it looks like in this case I have a prompt. We have the writer wants to conclude the passage by recalling a topic from the first paragraph that requires additional research. Which choice best accomplishes this goal? Okay, key thing here, whatever I say has to be contained in that first paragraph and it has to be a topic that requires some additional research. So what comes to mind um, right away, in my opinion, would be that linking that we talked about between the right and left sides of the brain. That was the big thing in the intro that we talked about that we haven't really discussed throughout this. So that's going to be the thing I'm going to look to link here. So we've got, however, as does the mechanism by which in the absence of a corpus callosum, the hemispheres of the marsupial brain communicate. Okay, that right there, option A, perfectly addresses what was in the intro. And I'll just quick show you that in the intro so you understand. Um, keep in mind, perfectly fine to go back to the intro and find um, just to check if it's there as well, okay? If I didn't know just right away and I was certain that it was there, I would go back and check as well. So I'll just go ahead and show you where it is. I'll, I'll highlight it. All right, let's go ahead and find where it's at. We talk about it right here, okay? So we've got left hemisphere of the brain controlling right side of the body. Right hemisphere controls the left. Corpus callosum allows communication between the hemispheres. Scientists have long believed the structure enables um, them to complete tasks. And then we talk about how uh, a recent finding and handedness, right? So we, we want to talk about that connection between the two okay the collection of nerve fibers we want to talk about that connection between the right and left sides all right so let's go down we go ahead and find our answer with that i believe i already answered that one we got 33 up yep. answer there is going to obviously be a now we go to move on to our next passage all right so we've got an employee that benefits and or an employee benefit that benefits employers all right so this right here is a pretty rare question type on the sat writing section so this type of question type, when you see you have a one at the beginning of a paragraph and it's not right here, right? If there was a one here and you were numbering all your sentences, right? There was a one there, there was like a two at your next sentence. Okay, that's the numbering of sentences. In this case, we have the numbering of paragraphs. So for the number of paragraphs, there's a couple ways you can approach it. I don't necessarily have um, one way that I think everyone has to do it. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. One thing that I would recommend doing is just going down. And if you have a paragraph question like that, Generally, it's going to be your last question in that passage. So we see in this case, it's 44. So a couple of ways you can handle these. One way is to, when you see that immediately, go find that question so you know what, what you're trying to do with the paragraphs. So in this case, and that's the way that I generally do it on the SAT writing section personally, and I've scored perfectly on the writing section twice. So if you want to use that, I'd recommend it. Um, but there are other ways that you can handle this as well. But this is, I guess, what I would recommend. So we have the writer wants to insert the following sentence. Still, since securing an excellent workforce is crucial to a business's success, employers should give serious thought to investing in reimbursement programs. To make the passage most logical, the sentence should be placed immediately after the last sentence in which paragraph. So key things here is I'm going to figure out where what, what should come before this sentence, since it should be the last sentence in a paragraph. Um, what should come before it? And then as I go through and read through, I can place it as I go. So... On second thought, I would actually say that this is a strategy I recommend. This is the only strategy I recommend. Um, if you really wanted to, you could probably read through and then just go back at the end and look at each paragraph, but that's going to waste your time, and I don't want you to waste time. So this is indeed going to be a strategy I recommend doing. Anytime you see the paragraph question like this, and you won't, the odds of you seeing it aren't really that high because it's pretty rare on the SAT writing section. Most of the time it's placing sentences. It's, it's pretty rare that you have to place um, a paragraph, but it could happen. If it does happen, my, my recommendation is that you go find that question 
and then you take a look at it, you read through it, and you try to place whatever you got to place as you read through. So in this case, what comes before, okay? And I'll, I, I'll talk about this at some point too with sentence placement as well. Um, but since this is going to come as our last sentence in our paragraph, we should know what comes before. So key thing I, that jumps out to me right away is the word still with a comma after it. I know that that's a transition from whatever my previous sentence is. And I know it's a transition of pretty much contrast, right? It's saying, um, in spite of something I say before it, still securing an excellent workforce is crucial. Thus, we should give serious thought to reimbursement programs. Thus, since I'm considering a contrast from what came before it, I'm guessing what comes before it then is going to have to be some sort of argument against these reimbursement uh, programs for tuition of these employees. So that's what I'm looking for what came before it. So what came before it, I'm looking for um, some sort of argument against providing tuition benefits. So it could be a counter argument um, if this is about uh, the benefits of providing tuition, but I'm looking for some sort of argument against providing these reimbursement benefits. So now let's go ahead and read through. All right, so we go back to the beginning. We got question 34. So we have, according to a 2014 report from the Society for Human Resource Management, 54% of surveyed companies provide tuition assistance to employees pursuing an undergraduate degree, and 50% do so for employees working toward a graduate degree. Okay, what jumps out to me with 34? I've got uh, three words underlined beginning of the sentence followed by a comma. Anytime I have words at the beginning of a sentence followed by a comma, immediately I'm thinking transition from my previous sentence to my current sentence. What I actually do is I actually skip reading this. Okay, it doesn't mean it's wrong right away, but I skip reading it and I want to know what my next sentence says so I can connect them. So I have more companies should consider helping employees pay for education because doing so helps. And in this case, I go ahead and answer 35 as well since I'm already reading the sentence. Since doing so helps, and I'm asked for which choice most effectively establishes the main idea of the passage. In this case, I don't necessarily know the main idea of the passage, but if I take a look at my title, I might be able to answer it real quick. We see an employee benefit that benefits employers. Okay, so I'm probably looking at uh, employers providing some benefit that's going to help both parties here. So increased customer satisfaction, I know is probably going to be wrong. And keep in mind, I'm going to start this and come back to it at the end of the passage, since I don't quite necessarily know for sure the main idea of the passage. So I would come back to this one, but I might be able to answer it just off the title and what I've read so far. We have option C, strengthen the U.S. economy. That's probably not what it's going to be about, considering the title is talking about benefits to employees and employers. Um, we have option B, solve the, rise, the problem of rising uh, tuition costs, that's not going to be a problem that is um, uh, a concern of the employers, but what is going to be a problem that's concerning them is going to be attracting and retaining employees. So my answer for 35 then is going to have to be answer choice D. So in that case, obviously I'll come back at the end if that turns out to be wrong, but it probably won't based on the answer choices that I'm seeing. So now we can go ahead and answer 34. Now that we've answered that, we have and improve the quality of the company's business. So We've got findings. We've got 54%, and then 50% of these employers are sort of, or of employees are pursuing these degrees. Um, so, how do we want to transition? Well, despite these findings, isn't providing a good transition here. So, I'm going to get rid of that one. Option of in addition to the 2014 report, we're not adding anything onto that 2014 report, so that's wrong. Um, next thing we have is although these levels are impressive, for that one right there, that one is a correct answer choice, and here's why. So, although these levels are impressive, right? We have 50% of uh, employers are providing tuition assistance for their employees. Okay, so that's um, an impressive level of response by these employers to provide it to about half, half these employers are providing it to their employees. So obviously that's impressive. However, we're arguing for more companies to do this. So these levels are impressive. We want more companies to do that. That's a good transition from our previous sentence to our new sentence, especially because we go on to explain why this is beneficial to those companies. Whether they want to or not, that's not connecting to that previous sentence where we talk about how there are impressive rates of employers providing these benefits. All right, moving on. We've got uh, part two. Now, keep in mind, obviously, we did not see what we wanted to in our um, before statement for that paragraph, uh, that sentence we want to place at the end of a paragraph, so we just keep reading. Tuition re reimbursement programs signal that employees or employers offer their workers opportunities. All right, what jumps out to me right away is I know this is going to be a question about plurals and possessives and uh, number with my nouns, right? Obviously, I can just tell that because I got uh, workers and I have opportunities and I've got apostrophes all over the place. So also, you see, you got the, the same two words all over here. So in this case, workers, do they own the opportunities? They do not own the opportunities. Thus, we're not going to want an apostrophe with workers. We get rid of D, we get rid of A. Next thing, do the opportunities own anything? The opportunities don't own anything. Thus, B is wrong as well, because there should be no apostrophe there. Thus, my answer for 36 is going to be answer choice C. So, key part here, if, if something doesn't own something, get rid of the apostrophe, unless it's a, an abbreviation like can't or don't, right? So, if you're dealing with possessives and it doesn't own anything, get rid of the apostrophe. 
That's really all there is to that question. So that one's pretty simple. All right, for personal and professional development, according to the professor of management, Peter Capelli, such opportunities are appealing to highly motivated and disciplined individuals and may attract applicants with these desirable qualities. Many in the business community concur or concur. Uh, explaining his company's decision to expand its tuition assistance program, John Fox, the director of dealer training at Fiat Chrysler Automobiles in the United States, stressed the importance. Okay, why is it stressed and not who's stressed or stressing or and he stressed? And how did I know that right away without looking at my answer choices? Well, here's how I knew that one right away. As I read through, I thought what would naturally be said there. In that case, stress. Why would we not say who's stressed? Because we already know who's talking, and that's John Fox, right? We have a non-essential phraser clause that I'm going to put in blue so you see it's non-essential. This is the non-essential part that I'm putting in blue, right? It can be taken out and the sentence still makes sense. Unless we would have John Fox who stressed the importance of drawing skilled employees. We don't need the word who because we already know who it is. So we want to get rid of that. We wouldn't say John Fox stressing the importance of drawing skilled employees to Fiat Chrysler's dealerships because if we're going to say stressing, we would have to say the word said right here and we don't. Thus, stressing is wrong as well. Saying, and he's stressed, once again, we already know who he is, thus we don't want to repeat that again. So that would be being repetitive and redundant. Thus, B will be our correct answer there. You can get that one by looking or just thinking what would you naturally say, also by using clues around you in order to avoid repetition and redundancy. Okay, always avoid repetition and redundancy. Once again, you see that coming back into play. Keep in mind, I'm still thinking about that sentence I have to place in the back of my mind. Still haven't said what I've seen, what I want to come before it yet. So we have paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees. And then I see I have retaining employees. I know I want to get rid of this. Okay. Anytime that you see you have a sentence or a subject, uh, a subject ending a sentence and starting the next one, you can pretty much know it's going to be asking you to combine the sentences, right? Um, so when, whenever I see that, one thing I'm going to look for is I'm going to look for using a comma instead of a period. And then I'm going to look for saying either who, if it was a person, um, we can use which, right? If it's some sort of subject, um, if it was some sort of time, we could say when, if it was some sort of place, we could say where. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to look to remove that period and put a comma and then one of these sort of four words in order to remove that repetition of the subject twice, right? We don't want to repeat those two subjects back to back because that's just not really good writing. Okay, so in this case, let's take a look at which one jumps right off the bat to me, right? That's going to be the comma and the which. So I see that if I pick answer choice C, which I'm going to because it's correct, I would have paying for tuition also helps businesses retain employees, which is important not only because it ensures a skilled and experienced workforce, but also because it mitigates the considerable cost of finding, hiring, and training new workers. Okay, that works perfectly. That's so, so efficient word choice. You're not going to get any more efficient in, than that. <coughs> All right, if we took a look at option D, we'd have a semicolon and then starting a sentence with that. We don't typically want to start a sentence with that, thus D is wrong. Um, if we take a look at option B, we have the retaining of whom. Once again, that's really wordy. We want to avoid wordiness on the SAT writing section. Option A, employees and this retention. We're repeating retention. We don't want to repeat that. Okay, We want to avoid repetition and redundancy. Thus, C is our correct answer. Employees who whose tuition is reimbursed often stay with their employer even after they complete their degrees. Okay, I see I have a period and I'm starting my sentence with because. I can just get rid of my period and say degrees because. Right? We know that because is one of those subordinating conjunctions, right? We talked about that with complex sentences. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the dependent clause of because their new qualifications give them opportunities for advancement within the company and connect it to our independent clause by just using this subordinating conjunction because. So correct answer there is going to be C. We don't need a colon between it, right? We don't need a semicolon. Also, we can't have a semicolon because what comes after is not an independent clause. Uh, same thing with the, uh, with the colon, right? We don't need a colon there either. Uh, option A, we can't just start a sentence, uh, we can't do a period and then say because there are new qualifications, because that's a dependent clause, not an independent clause, thus that would be grammatically incorrect as well. All right, the career of Valerie Lincoln, employee at the aerospace company United Technologies Corp, Corporation, UTC. Okay, key thing that jumped out to me right away is I saw the career of Valerie Lincoln, and then I'm going on with a non-essential phrase or clause describing her. How do I know it's not essential? Well, because if I take out everything I'm about to put in blue, all the way from here, all the way to here, my sentence still makes sense. We would have the career of Valerie Lincoln is a significant success story for a company's tuition reimbursement program. Okay, that's a sentence on its own. Thus, what's in blue is not essential. How do I know that I need a comma after UTC then? Because in this case, I have a comma after Lincoln. Thus, I have to offset the end of my non-essential Fraser clause with a comma as well. Thus, I should have answer choice D as my correct answer. UTC with parentheses and then a comma. All right, so that one right there. Just dealing with uh, non-essential phrases or clauses, I talked about that a little bit um, when I talked about the writing and grammar rules, so that one right there, not too difficult. 
We have, uh, in eight years at UTC, Lincoln earned associate and bachelor's degrees in business and advanced from an administrative assistant position to an accounting associate position. This allowed UTC to retain an employee with a deep knowledge. Okay, in this case, I've got, and let me just grab a drink here because my throat's really dry. All right, so we've got, this allowed UTC to retain an employee. I've got one word underlined middle of the sentence. So in this case, how do I know what kind of question this is? Okay, identifying questions on the SAT writing section is really helpful. In this case, I've got one word underlined middle of the sentence. I see that I've got three other options for the words. Now these are different base words. So this isn't dealing with tense. Additionally, <clears throat> these are adjectives. So what is this dealing with? This is dealing with tone and style of my passage, as well as diction. If you don't know what diction is, it just means word choice. So in this case, what's going to be the best choice here? Well, her knowledge, it's in-depth because she has years in industry and years of valuable experience. So what would we describe in-depth knowledge as? We would describe it as deep knowledge. It's not hidden knowledge, not spacious knowledge, and it's not large knowledge either. So our answer there is going to be A. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to question 42. So we've got question 42. All right, keep in mind, I'm still trying to place that sentence, but I haven't seen what should come before it yet. So we have tuition reimbursement can be expensive and many companies would find it impractical to pay for multiple degrees for all employees. Businesses have succeeded in minimizing and keeping down costs. These two things mean the same. Thus, A, no change is going to be incorrect. What about option B, minimizing costs associated with employees' coursework and ensuring the relevance of employees' coursework. We're repeating coursework twice. I don't like that. That's repetitive and redundant. Get rid of B. Option C, being effective at keeping down costs. Once again, we see that they have succeeded. So if we're going to say being effective, that's also repetitive and redundant. C is incorrect. Option D, keeping down costs. Nothing repetitive or redundant about that. That's real efficient, real concise. I like answer choice D. D is the correct answer. All right. Just notice how ruthless I am about repetition and redundancy, though. I really don't like it, and you shouldn't either. If you're picking a choice or an answer choice that's repetitive or redundant, you're going to get the question wrong. That's just how it's going to go. All right, so moving on, we got by offering fixed amounts of reimbursement each year and stipulating which subjects workers can study. Even with these methods, tuition reimbursement may not be appropriate in all cases, especially if all classes are likely to divert employees' time and energy from their jobs. Notice that I did not hesitate as I read through, or at least not for more than maybe uh, 0.1 seconds, right? There's nothing wrong with that one. Um, everything there is idiomatic, okay? Everything there sounds right, looks right. Everything there is correct. We would say to divert because we need that infinitive tense. So our correct answer there, to divert. Okay, that one's got that, uh, what's it called? Let me just think for a minute. It has the, uh, it's got the, yeah, it's just got the infinitive tense. You have to have the infinitive tense there. All right, so now what did we just talk about there? Well, we talked about how it might not be appropriate in all cases. This tuition reimbursement program might not be appropriate in all cases, especially if classes are likely to divert employees time and energy from their jobs. What is that? That is a counter argument. What is it talking about? It's an argument against tuition reimbursement programs. Well, what did I say? I said that what comes before it should be an argument against tuition reimbursement programs. Thus, where should we place this sentence? We should place it after sentence four. Okay, so that's the big benefit to coming up with your own answer choice first. And that's why I actually uh, said that you should be using this method of looking at um, that question that deals with paragraphs and placing things because by doing that we see that we're easily able to figure out where this should go and we really avoid any sort of confusion and any sort of having to run back through our different paragraphs and see where it should go because let's say that it had been in paragraph one and we just finished paragraph four and then let's say we went four three two one in our order we just had to reread parts of paragraph two parts of paragraph three parts of paragraph four in order to all the way get back to one. So as you can see, this is a really good way to save time on the SAT reading section. Obviously, it's a method I recommend. Uh, so correct answer for 44 there is going to be D. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, so that's the lessons for today. Tomorrow's video will be up tomorrow. As always, thank you for watching. Make sure to have a great day. Like, share, and subscribe. There'll be a donation link in the description as well if you would like to donate to me. And as always, have a great day.